Hey there. So um, I'm all through the immigration process here in Ecuador. I did the three videos, and I had the opportunity to actually do an interview with the lawyer that I used. Um, as I say, for coming on this channel, find some, you know pay somebody to help you. Don't try to do this process yourself. Uh, did that both in Mexico and Ecuador. And I uh, thought it would be nice to have an interview with somebody who actually knows what they're talking about, as opposed to me repeating things I'm pretty sure I heard right. So let's get it from the proverbial horse's mouth and have a quick interview with the lawyer I used, Sarah Chaka. And this is that interview. Tell us about your company, who you are, and what you do. Okay, so, well, my name is um, Sarah Chaka, and I am attorney at law in Ecuador, and I am the owner of Ecuador Vistas, who is a law firm who assists expat to move to Ecuador. Um, we specialize in migration process mm -hmm, to any person who from any country that wish to move here. Now, what, uh, this wasn't a prep question, so it, it, what's easiest? What, what's the easiest country that you've had to bring somebody from? Uh, well, I think so is a couple list of countries that the process is different than others. Um, in special, the countries that are in the list that need to, that cannot enter Ecuador with a regular tourist visa. Um, so that kind of countries, I can give you one example, like people uh, from Philippines, uh, oh. their process is different than, for example, uh, people from Canada or from the United States, um, because the Philippines and another list of countries needs to uh, get a tourist visa for they can enter Ecuador and after that apply maybe for a temporary residence visa. Okay. Now, your process is a little different from what I've heard from other people, which I found interesting. Um, I talked to other folks uh, that have worked with some of the other visa providers who they have successfully worked with. They haven't had problems with them, but they're a little different. They have to go to the appointments and do stuff. You had me do an NDA. Uh, no, sorry, not an NDA. I, I should never talk legal terms. You had me do a power of attorney for visa purposes, only very narrow power of attorney. Took my passport, and then I sat out on the beach and relaxed for the next couple of weeks. Um, well, I assume you did some work because a, a little while later, I, I got a visa. So mm -hmm. is that normal for you or is it just because it wasn't in Cuenca? Um, really, that the same concept that was applicable for you is for all of my clients. It um, doesn't matter where they are. They can be like in Manta, like you, you know, in Manabi area or in Quito or in even the Amazon can be in any place of Ecuador and I can apply for their visa to a power of attorney. Of course, all of these process is already pre-planned uh, before my client arrive. So before the client arrive to Ecuador, so for we can administrate like the application more effectively. So it, it is good to know that you know uh, that not all the persons can apply to a power of attorney, and this depends if the applicant uh, has a criminal record. In the case that the applicant has a criminal record, it will be necessary a personal interview in the ministry to um, about this criminal record. So that is the, the the big difference. But most of my clients. Uh, apply to a power of authority. Okay, which uh, you made me think of a question. When, when I was doing the background check video, I actually looked to see what could get you not accepted in Ecuador. And I couldn't find any lists like, you know, uh, jaywalking, spitting on the sidewalk. I couldn't find anything that would keep you from uh, getting accepted in Ecuador. What are some, are, are there any? Big, big things that if they're on your background check, you're going to have a really, really difficult time 
Maybe, mm. maybe you want to go to Mexico. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it, there aren't any list of like list of crimes that Ecuador uh, has that can um, limit to the expat to move here. But in any ways, the people who contact me and uh, because with experience that I have, uh, I already know and I can explain my, my client which situations are acceptable and which they, situations are not acceptable. So um, depends on the, the incident that happened in, in the life of the applicant. So it's some like um, criminal records that cannot be acceptable. And I am very honest with them that uh, even the, these kind of applicants not try to apply because we will be the claim. And other ones that, for example, I can give you some, one that is very common at DUI is very common. So um, uh, that is the one that really um, felonies. Uh, that is no any like serious uh, situation. So that will be acceptable. But of course, um, the people who contact me, um, the, one of the questions that I do is if they have some any kind of record. Uh, so for I can analyze and I can explain them it will be acceptable or not. Okay, interesting. That's cool. So th this whole channel is, it's, it's named Nomadic Nerd. It's a, about popping around the countries. I haven't done a lot, but you know, basically being that nomadic tech geek, because all I really need is a laptop. And there's a lot of countries that have developed uh, so-called digital nomad visas. And um, mm -hmm. Ecuador sort of did one. They, I think it's called the Rentista visa. Did I get that right? Yes, yes, Brian. So yeah, we have um, two like what I can say like two brand new categories. One is the Rentista. Uh, well, the concept of Rentista is that the, in this case. Ecuador will accept the application for a person who receive a rent. Uh, this rent can come from um, property that they rent, yeah, or some investments that the applicant uh, has and uh, receive a monthly income. The minimum income that uh, the applicant need to have to apply for a rentista visa is a $1,350 this year, 2023. That's the minimal amount of money that is acceptable for rentista and need to be proved by rent. So I give you one example. If you uh, rent your house and you receive a rent of $1,350, you can apply for rentista visa. What is the document that you need to show? The lease contract. Uh, so in any ways, it's very important that the, this lease contract is for the minimum of two years. That is the minimum uh, period of time that will be acceptable to uh, obtain, uh, sorry, to apply and obtain a rentista visa. Oh, yeah, it's that two year that kind of caught my eye because a lot of the digital nomad crowd that are working off W-2 or working off contract to contract, they're not going to have a two year contract. And I thought that was kind of a Achilles heel of this particular visa for a digital nomad. Yeah, well, digital nomad visa is another category. Uh, what I explained was the rentista visa. Yeah, digital nomad visa is for that people who has a, some kind of work uh, that they can um, do from any country and of course have a salary for, for that work. So what is the important um, documents for this kind of work that first need to uh, show uh, that they are giving this service to this person of this company. And how you prove this? 
can be to a work contract or can be to a letter that your uh, employer can issue for you. And this letter need to explain who you are, what kind of work you are doing, what kind of activity you are doing for this person, this company, and how much will be your salary. And it's very important that also explain that the work that you will have will be for the minimum two years or more. Why this is so important? Because the Nomad Digital Visa is only issued for two years, like the same like the other visas, like the temporary and a residence visa, like pension, investor, professional. Yeah, and just for record, professional is what I did where you register your college degree. And yes. And just to assure everyone, the actual grades are not looked at, right? Just the fact that you have a degree. Exactly, yes. That's a matter uh, what, uh, you know, what kind of degree is of like your grades. Like, that really is no relevant information. What the most important is that you have a university degree that um, you got from uh, your college and also can be a, a master or PhD, you know, bachelor, master or PhD, and you can apply for professional visa. That is different to a nomad digital visa because nomad digital visa is for the people who works for another or for themselves, but they can prove that. And professional visa is in the basic of your university degree, bachelor, master or PhD, and you can apply also for this kind of visa. And specifically, uh the minimum is a bachelor's, it can't be a, a two-year associate's degree? Um, in general, no, okay. um, but in any ways, I will explain you something that um, in Ecuador also is the technologic uh, like diplomas and um, if the, these like um, the two years or three years degree is um, equal or better, then um, diploma that can be issued by the, uh, an institution uh, can be approved. But also that need to be checked before the person try to apply for the visa. So it is possible. I have some of the clients that we can approve three years uh, degree, uh, but in any ways, not two years. I don't have that kind of experience for the two years degree. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then one last thing, I, I know you're an immigration attorney, you're not a tax advisor, we're not giving tax advice, so nobody can come back and sue us if we say something wrong here. Uh, one of the things that, uh, Tom, I, there's an article that you wrote, um, I forget the name of the magazine, but it was about taxes in Ecuador uh, for expats um, who are uh, not, not getting money and not earning money from an Ecuadorian company, but are like a digital nomad getting a, getting money from another company outside of Ecuador, like the States or Canada or something like that. Uh, do you remember this article? Uh, well, so far, well, yes, I brought like a um, few articles about like in general tax. So far, the information that I have in uh, from IRS is that the expats and, and residents don't pay tax and their money that they receive from another country. This includes pension or any kind of salary. And this is the last answer that I have. Well, as I told you, I am not expert in tax and really very respectfully, I am not sure if also the person who give me the answer, they are sure what they told me. So, but so far with all my clients eh, that they have even assets in Ecuador, they know they pay tax for that. What my accountant explained me is that eh, a person can be Ecuadorian, this person Ecuadorian or expat needs to declare tax when they receive a income of $12,000 or more per year. So that is the general explanation that I received by my accountant. By the IRS, they explained to me that 
foreigners don't pay tax if they receive a foreigner income in Ecuador. And that is the answer that I have for you. Okay. So always check with your, your own tax advisor and, and double yes. check. And just my general recommendation will be that always be aware from the official websites that this is only the government ones uh, from IRS that explain you um, if you need to uh, declare. But in all my time working with expats so far, I don't uh, receive this kind of news like in the clear way that you need to declare tax for these reasons. So I don't have that information. Okay. And just FYI for anybody from the US that might be listening to this, doesn't matter where you make money, what you do, if you have a dollar coming to you, the US wants you to declare it and you do have to file taxes in the US if you're a US citizen, there's no getting out of that. Uh, that's uh, yeah. your birthright yes. as a US citizen. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> well, well, that is actually the bottom of the list. Of, I think at the bottom of the list of questions, I don't think I missed any. Is there anything you want to add in? Well, um, that there are many different types of visas, um, but in any ways, the ones that any person can apply for their own resorts will be always pension visa, investor visa, professional visa, that is the one that you have, a nomad digital visa, rentista visa. So uh, with these kind of categories, any person can look at what is the category that is applicable for them. And of course, that uh, any country that is not in the list that uh, of Ecuador require a visa, they can enter to Ecuador just with their passport. So like the United States, Canada, uh, some countries of Europe, so, and Ecuador is welcome to receive tourists. And that's for 90 days, and then you can extend it for another 90, for a total of yes. 180. Yeah. Uh, yes, that is correct. So. so, if you just want to hang out for a couple of months, you really don't need to get an official visa. You can just come and hang out for a couple of months and then go home. Exactly. So, that will depend really much in the personal situation that each person uh, has. But in general, Ecuador allow you to stay here in the country as a tourist 180 days. 90 days with a tourist visa that you will receive when you enter the country, that is stamp, and another 90 days with extension visa. Quite nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. So only the person who wants to stay more than 180 days um, they need to look for a um, temporary residence visa. Okay. Well, Sarah, thank you for your time and the information. You're welcome. So thank you very much, Brian, for inviting me, really. I feel so, um, so nice that you take me in consideration. Well, it's nice to have actually somebody who knows what they're talking about talk for once on this channel instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Take care and safe travels tomorrow. So I thought it was awfully nice of Sarah to give up um, some some of her time and have this interview with me. It's not like I'm a big YouTube channel. It's going to drive a lot of revenue her way. So I appreciated it. So as I mentioned, get somebody to help you. I chose Sarah. So I think I talked in another video of the why, but let me give you the why. It's so basically she had some articles written out there on immigration, tax advice, things like that, as we mentioned in the interview. So I like to see somebody who was published. Uh, she's also an actual lawyer, which I don't know if that's important, but it made me feel better knowing that I had somebody with a law degree that has at least had some education in this in the area of law and could do this. And she had been obviously following immigration laws pretty closely uh, just from her writings. And the other thing, which this is a very American thing, is I didn't have to give her a bunch of money up front in cash. Uh, that just feels odd uh, to me. I don't think it's that uncommon in some parts of the world, but it's odd to me. I could work, um, give her half up front. I could do that via electronically, which uh, since I was in the U.S. when I started this was very convenient. So it made e working with her easy. So uh, again, the same 
uh, advice I'd give to anyone working on this process, uh, frequent. Uh, Sarah might not like the amount of frequency I did, but she was very tolerant of it. Frequent, precise communication to make sure that you understand what's next in the process and that everybody is on the same page with the process. I did the Sarah and we did it successfully and I got my degree registered. I got a visa down here. So I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, again, thanks to Sarah. And if you like the sort of stuff, subscribe. I'll try to get more interviews and uh, more content up as I can. Take care. Hope to see you on the road somewhere.